Hello everyone, today we talk about the Ottoman preparations to the campaign of Vienna in 1683. A couple of days ago we made a video for the series on uh, Prince Eugene, uh, talking roughly about the, you know, the international political situation, uh, focusing on the Ottoman Empire proper. Today we will go a bit more in depth on the this perspective and more specifically on the diplomatic uh, background of the uh, campaign, the ensnaring uh, that the Ottomans carried out, the damage of, of the Habsburgs, but also more or less the awareness of other powers of this uh, campaign and the, you know, the, also the intelligence, like the, the attempt to, to mask this all uh, at the beginning. And when we look at these stories, I always try to insert as many details a as I can on the cultural side of the story. It is to try to increase a little bit the, the context, um, um, trying to, to understand, try, or of course not uh, achieving it, the, the, the mindset of the contendants, how different that world actually was, but also how much of, of that world that happened um, in, in these years mm, still influences us uh, properly and has built what we still have. Um, in at many levels of the story, um, starting from the comet, you would say you know start with a comet. Yes, exactly. This ambiguous astral uh, sign that traditionally, since ancient times, was associated with the announcer of future misfortunes, catastrophes like I don't know earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, but also political events that would bring naturally, depending on which side you you look at it. Um, very bad things, um, but for the Christian sensitivity of the time, things had changed um, since when Giotto, uh, frescoing the walls of the Scrovegna chapel in Padua, attributed to uh, this uh, still, you know, mm, scary, objectively, but also mm, amazing, admirable aspect of the of Halley's comet. Um, what um, thirty hundred uh, years before had uh, crossed the skies of Judea announcing the birth of the Savior. right? And uh, a friendly comet to the Christian had been the one of Halley in 1456, for example, it reappeared announcing, at this time in the Balkanic skies, the victory of the Crusaders of John Uniadi and of uh, Giovanni da Capestrano in Belgrade. Right. And we, we talked about this episode, actually we will come back on it, but you know, it was this admirable event that also, by the way, the crusade culminated also with the death of the two because of the plague, uh, but at the same time it was a, an important Christian victory, eventually was not exploited by the crusaders, uh, but it, nevertheless it, it was associated to the appearance of Allah's comet, so replicating allegedly what Giotto and the Christian tradition had already um, assumed as, as a positive symbol of the comet. But, in fact, not all the tailed and shining sisters of Halley's comet were fortunate, such as the one that in 1669, just to come closer to our events, had shown on the fall of Candia after the 20 years siege um, of, of the Ottomans um, against the, the Venetians and their allies that had existed in a atrociously um, heroic way, we could, could say, uh, and that had really uh, inflicted a heavy blow to, uh, to the West in the sense at least that, you know, Venice so uh, itself uh, herself deprived a major um, base in, in, the, in the Eastern Mediterranean that the Ottomans suffered actually a lot of of uh, in terms of costs of sheer two hundred thousand dead, right? But the victory ultimately had been theirs, um, and this event recalled in a you know society that was uh, still echoing after all uh, much of uh, classicism after the, the Renaissance, um, and the diffidence, the distrust that the ancients had always manifested towards the celestial body with the shiny uh, tail. And in 1682, uh, at least two uh, comets appeared, right, that naturally uh, 
afterwards were interpreted as the omen respectively of the plots of the Huguenots against the Sun King right which is a good you know flipping of the role of the persecutors and the persecuted um, and of the Ottoman assault on Vienna there are many coincidences as you understand but we know how you know certain uh, ones can be found you know fabricating the <coughs> the nice tale afterwards, but uh, you know, at least under certain aspects we can mm, observe uh, from this perspective of the secrecy of the, you know, of the political decisions uh, how much the, you know, the slowness of communications played uh, a role in all this, you know, in a very important one. For example, only five days before the reunion at Luxembourg um, where the Holy Roman Emperor had decided to commit himself to uh, renew actually the truce with the sublime port uh, within the enclosure of the top copy had taken place another one that actually was very similar and parallel uh, but yet you know opposite uh, as an intention to the previous one because on August the 6th 1682 during one uh, seat of the great divan, the divan i Umayun, right in the Sultan's palace of Constantinople, had triumphed the uh, political line proposed by the Grand Vizier, Kara Mustafa. Um, this decision would have literally changed the history of Europe and of the, of the Ottoman Empire forever. Um, and what was established in the secret pavilions of the Grand Sarai was in fact a new offensive against the empire through Hungary. Um, the 20 years truce that had been signed at Vazvar uh, would have mm, uh, expired in, by 1664, right? And the Ottoman decision had been taken in counterposition to the proposal from the side of mm, a, a consistent part of the councillors that um, actually were positive about renewing the same truce, right? And it's difficult actually to reconstruct what, what happened in this divan um, because uh, for us, at least today, with a you know heavily modern and nice and, and secularized mindset. We, we, we find it almost impossible to conceive how such an important decision could be taken in such a tense atmosphere. Uh, imagine all the doubts and the rivalries, the competition at court, you know, this um, fierce, um, you know, think about the amount, the sheer amount of interests uh, in, in, at stake um, that could be any way taken um, in the respect of the rigorous etiquette of the Ottoman court that imposed the almost absolute silence. Right. Um, and even, in fact, for the most serious and urgent uh, decisions, there was the uh, silent uh, si uh, sign language. Right. Um, for in the same way, uh, the seats of the greatest, of the highest councillors of the Sultan happened regularly uh, with this aura of presence, absence of the salt. The figure of the sultan had been so much idealized and, and uh, regulated and conceptualized and uh, um, risen uh, above the, the whole uh, imperial concept that um, it, it was almost a, you know, uh, semi-divine uh, entity, right? So that he, the, the presence, the silence, the the non-visibility here played a, a dramatically important role also just from a psychological point of view I mean this was scary right people were to fear the Sultan of, of how couldn't they right and nobody knew uh, ever whether after uh, a window that actually looked into the divan was is actually a you know, a room right if you visit top cap that, that's the that there is the same <coughs> window you can't see here uh, behind this um, uh, separate let's say um, the where, where the sultan might have been right and and that um, uh, actually stood 
over the head of the Grand Vizier, so it's <laughs> like his Damocles sword, right? In, in, and this, this is particularly true considering Kara Mustafa's fate, right? Um, in which this, this jealousy was so thick that it's not to be seen, not to be ever perceived, right? As a sultan, and the Padishah, which is actually the official title of, of the sultan, right? Who was there, or or not? in that moment surveilling his ministries was was a mystery in many ways but they had to knew that he might have been that implicitly of course he would have known um, in a way or another and and definitely this was a continuous threat right and the, uh, the the prime minister uh, always feared for his head right he was always very uh, suspicious and very you know measured in words and in acts, and definitely we have seen also how the uh, court language um, uh, imposition on on expression, right? And the point is that we don't know how the story went either in that specific case, right? We don't know much actually about the relations between Mehmet IV, uh, Padishah, and Kara Mustafa. We don't know if they had agreed this decision, right? Um, and we don't know if uh, the Sultan had given green light to his Prime Minister to, to, to this for this enormous decision, or whether if um, the Grand Vizier actually had his own trusty spies and he knew uh, pretty well that uh, the Sultan was uh, not spying on him on his own shoulders and hidden behind the thick jealousy over his own head, right? We uh, we don't know also whether the the influence that the first minister exercised had been such as to authorize the same sultan to such uh, an imprudence like that one. We will never know, right? Um, here I talk about imprudence, not really to give um, a historical judgment, right? Uh, we we should actually analyze the, the campaign as it went. By what we we know, in generally speaking, we we can't see, but actually a very, a very dramatic threat posed to Vienna. I mean, let's be honest about it. Vienna had fallen. We have seen it in the, um, in the series of Prince uh, again. Nobody was giving it for safe. Nobody would think uh, it was already lost. There was a time in which Christianity thought that Vienna was already lost, and it started from. And even if, unfortunately, we lack historical particulars about the, the decisional process uh, in Constantinople, um, and we don't even know whether, for example, the, the thing was actually discussed in the Divan, right? It, but at, at least we know it was decided in that seat, in substance, the resuming of the hostilities in the Balkan Danubian area. Right, um, and we know, of course, that this was not just an Ottoman desire, but that this decision was directly or indirectly, but surely, you know, hotly um, supported by the French diplomacy and the Hungarian rebels, that we will see now in a while. Um, and this decision didn't, per se, actually um, in imply anything about the siege of Vienna herself, right? Um, um, this had been an opportunity, we have seen it in, in the last video, with the campaign of 1663-64 uh, that had culminated with the Battle of St. Gotthard, um, August of Rab, whatever you want to call it, but Raymond de Montecuccoli had defeated the Ottoman army when Vienna was completely defenseless. You know, that battle decided literally the fall of Vienna, right? This is 20 years later. The Habsburgs hadn't done excessively much now to, to change the situation. Also, they were, you know, short of, of, of resources, technically, but also they had properly overlooked the threat at that point. But um, the, the opportunity had been there. And as we will see later, Vienna was not a city like all the others, right? It was considered the capital of the empire, even if it was not such a thing, institutionally speaking, right? You know, the Vienna was not even properly the capital of the Habsburgs, uh, 
because there was no capital still at that time. We were living still in feudal times in many ways. You know, the process of centralization of the state, in especially in Austria, is yet to be taken a you know a full form. Um, but nevertheless, the importance of the city was extraordinary. But 20 years before, there was literally nothing, nothing between the Ottoman army of several tens of thousands of troops and Vienna, but Montecuc. Right. Those 20 years were very, very precious for Vienna in 1683 to put up a, a resistance that paid for. Um, and it seems that the explicit objective of the, uh, it seems, because once again we don't concretely know, if not from some indirect evidence, that the explicit objective of what was decided um, in that divan was the occupation of the fortresses of Gyur and Komaron, that are the true proper uh, keys of the Danube, and not just of the royal red uh, Abs Absburgic Hungary, but even of the same both the terrestrial and river route towards Vienna. Right? And it, it's not easy to believe, even if you know we still have this unsolvable doubts, that um, Mehmed the Fort wanted to run the risk to go forward so much that he uh, in some ways he didn't want um, to be so much uh, ill-advised even just indirectly but up to which point right for example both by the can of the Crimean Tartars and the uh, Baylor Bay of Buda because an attack on Vienna would have made running the risk to cause actually uh, our reaction all over the Christian world. Right. And here we have to talk a bit about Mehmed the Fort because this Sultan is definitely a fascinating figure, right? He was more than 40 years old at that point. He, he was introverted and melancholic. Um, he was very influenced by his mother who was of a very different nature compared to his, uh, you know, crazy father. Right? He was known as the Delhi, as a matter of fact. We, we talked about him just two days ago. He was cultivated in the heroic Ottoman memories. He was a sincere admirer of the deeds of his uncle Murad, uh, the fort that, um, you know, had conquered Baghdad, for example. And, and for this reason, the same Mehmet uh, dreamed for himself the glory of the conquest of a city such as Constantinople or Baghdad, right, uh, of the, the seats of universal powers, by, by definition, that Vienna somewhat embodied from, from the Holy Roman Imperial perspective. Mehmed had actually not demonstrated much of a military inclination, uh, nor for the war-like adventures or military life in the first place, but, you know, the conquest of Vienna, the Red Apple, uh, governed by the uh, Christian emperor would have granted to Mehmet to declare himself heir of that empire such as the conqueror of Constantinople had actually done in the same way two centuries before for the, for the Byzantine Empire. Uh, after all, the Ottoman sultans bore regularly and formally the title of Sultan i Rum. Right, The Ottomans were sultans of Rome. And the ambitions of the uh, the Padisha uh, exposed him to suffer the influence of Kara Mustafa, right? And uh, who, uh, in his own turn, had possibly imprudently uh, given up to the pressures and the suggestions of the um, rebel Hungarian nobles, right? And also, quite certainly, to the perspectives of you know, glory and, you know, rich booty and, and even, as it's been hypothesized, of the uh, ambition to avenge the honor of the Köprülü family uh, that had been compromised at the uh, with the defeat of St. Gotthard. Um, Kara Mustafa had been a protégé of the Köprülü family that had uh, commanded, they were basically the 
Bailey Bay of Buddha and that uh, had uh, also uh, pushed for, for the campaign of 1663-64 and commanded the, the Ottoman army uh, uh, to, to, to defeat, right? Um, and however, if truly, since from the beginning, uh, Kara Mustafa thought about Vienna, right, and uh, still we don't know, the Vizier counted not much on a violent conquest, right, a, a brutal, you know, a destruction, a extermination, but on a capitulation, which would have gained uh, uh, the Ottomans much more interesting fruits, because, uh, sure, the booty that the sack would have been less, but himself, right, because the Grand Vizier is the second most powerful person after the Sultan, except some maybe familiar uh, element in this regard, would have not had to share it with the troops, right, as instead it should have been in case of a city that was fallen um, after an assault was implied by the low sacking from the side of the conquering armies. On the other hand, conquering um, by stall, a, a great stronghold such as Vienna, would have been by itself a very difficult business, right? And uh, and uh, capture followed by a sack and even maybe by the destruction implied a very heavy risk or over this, you know, unanimous at that point and, and tide-like reaction of the Christian world desiring a vendetta. And the Grand Vizier aimed at a possibly long siege and therefore, and more interestingly, to patient negotiations, right? And he wasn't excluded in this regard, neither to, you know, actually play um, on the, you know, an agreement um, brought upon, actually, the um, advantageous proposals of the, of the other side, and especially with the French diplomatic mediation, right? Because at that point, they would have not had but to wait and to just you know, uh, be asked for, for mercy, and, you know, the French especially would have seized the opportunity to let the Turks do uh, a bit th their own part, and, you know, gaining um, from, you know, the, the, well, the French gaining something on, on their own side against the Habsburgs. And this is very important, because actually we have a royal message in, uh, sent to uh, Constantinople on April the 8th, 1682. And we know that Louis XIV had disposed um, so much that the ambassador, Guy Herag, could make the, the possible to convince the Sultan to direct its next uh, military effort not towards Poland, but Hungary, right? And this is evidently to, uh, you know, to, to keep the Emperor busy from uh, eventual... Um, uh, aims to in, of intervention in Alsace, where the French were extending their their control, and it was so that on the evening of on, of August the sixth, sixteen eighty two, seven took the, the fatal pointed hills insignia of the warriors of the steppes, which the Ottomans exposed proudly, uh, remembering their military ethnic origins, were exposed in front of the imperial gate of the Topkapi Palace. And this was, in the Ottoman uh, diplomacy, the signal of the imminent uh, uh, leave of the Sultan, actually for an armed travel that, in line of principle, um, was prospected always as a military campaign, right? When the Sultan moved, it was because, you know, he, he went out there killing some infidel. This was the concept. Uh, even when, actually, it was only um, on for one of those long um, hunting trips that lasted for many months, right, and for whom Mehmet, the fort was famous. Right? Um, and he had won, actually, um, his entire court and the army that constituted his bodyguard and uh, 
uh, they would have moved um, as soon as possible to spend the winter in Edirne, right at the center of a region that is very, you know, favorable um, for actually the, those aforementioned hunting trips that um, caused a colossal uh, massacre of game. Uh, and uh, all of this had therefore um, passed unobserved to the to uh, Holy Roman Imperial representative in Constantinople. There were the Baron Georg Christoph Konitz that lived uh, in there since um, since two years, and the Count Alberto Caprara that was sent to assist him. And their periodical dispatches to Vienna were ever more alarming, right? The condition of the two diplomats, by the way, um, with many variables, you know, as it was really normal at the time, was marked by this mm, curious ambiguity between the function of, let's say, tolerated spy and the one of hostage. This is early modern diplomacy in a nutshell, and it's naturally based on information, counter-information, and this ensnaring that was put up uh, in here. Naturally, the ambassadors couldn't, um, I mean, they were limited in their function, but we, we should point out that even from their kind of difficult position that um, kept them, just even think about the, the human dimension of these people, think about the anxiety, right? and. Uh, for what concern, for example, for, for their own personal uh, incolumity, right? But also for the um, material conditions of the same, um, and that actually at the Ottoman court, for you know, the imperial ambassadors consisted also in a certain freedom of movement and uh, even the ability of collecting information, right? Um, but for, from this situation, they both understood that something. Well, it was something big was going to happen, right? It was being prepared at that point. And surely, um, basically, neither of them, uh, neither of the two, as, as much as basically no one else, would have actually foretold that this was, in a you know, bigger, in a longer time perspective, the uh, beginning of the uh, second uh, lo uh, Turkish long war right after the one that had been fought um, between 1593 and 1606 and that would have lasted in fact f from 1683 to 1699 to Karlovitz and eventually uh, to be resumed as we will hopefully see in the Prince Eugene's series between uh, 16, uh, 1716 and 1718 and uh, together that together with the you know, European wars that were fought in the meanwhile would have deeply changed um, th the uh, European and Mediterranean balance, right? And especially allowed the takeoff of Habsburgic Austria as a real European great power. And what eventually happened was somewhat incoherent uh, compared to Mehmet's plan and also pretty one of his prime minister, powerful prime minister, and the recognition um, in the intentions at least, and this uh, was uh, even, you know, as we will see, there was even a royal crown to be debated in here, of the uh, chief of the Hungarian insurrections, was by itself a substantial act of war against whom occupied the elective throne of Hungary, right, the Habsburgs now the one of royal Hungary to a prince that declared himself to be a vassal of the port equated obviously to a declaration of sovereignty on someone else's territory right and the Viennese chancery showed to be you know to, to give actually a, a, a small importance to this episode that had already by itself uh, been a violation of the truce of Vaspar uh, before that the you know this the, the terms of the truce would have uh, expired but there was more than this because with its military conquests and the um, tactical say strategical um, 
plant of, of his power, Imre Tokhuri, doesn't matter whether he was working to the construction of his own kingdom or to the independence of, of his country, which are two different things, was building, however, an important uh, trait of the military road that, uh, in a short while, the Ottoman army would have used. And it's kind of obvious that at that time, in five days, no news could have, uh, you know, arrived on uh, the Bosphorus from, from the Danube, right? Not even the fastest uh, and most resilient um, traveler pigeon uh, would have, you know, uh, freed by the, the most able and, uh, you know, quick spy that we can imagine could have covered this distance of 260 kilometers per day flying f five consecutive days to to cover the necessary 1300. Um, but uh, also in absence of such a prodigious, you know, bird, and that the decisions taken inside the Sarail were surrounded by the most uh, strict uh, secrecy, uh, the reality of things would have not been so difficultly, um, you know, guessable if the internal rivalries of the Holy Roman Imperial Court and the complexity of the European affairs would have um, basically, uh, sh you know, shaded the decisions of Leopold of Habsburg, Leopold I, the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, and of course, uh, uh, it's easy, of course, to, to, to look at history ex post, right? It's very easy for us historians to pretend that there were some uh, deterministic uh, reason um, and speak of a sort of imminent reason of history for which, you know, everybody kind of knew how the thing would have gone because, you know, eventually it was so big the way it's gone that, you know, it, it's strange that it would have not been foretold. But we have also to be concrete about this and observed that all the signs were undeniably out there, right? Because if you look at the Balkans, you see it, it was at this rising uh, and peculiar tension, rising ever since at least uh, Kara Mustafa had risen to the head of the Ottoman government and the two facts were to be obviously considered as dependent on one another. The, the Austrian diplomats at Constantinople had immediately signaled this, right, you know, the news of this kind had arrived also from Rome uh, and uh, Venice um, and surely also from Paris, frankly, uh, and uh, if even if Pope Innocent XI had multiplied ever since his, you know, rise to um, Peter's soil, the appeals for a new preemptive uh, strike against uh, the Ottomans um, this didn't depend only, contrarily wise to, you know, some uh, kind of uh, biased observer or and superficial observer would have pointed out from this pre, you know, ob ob obstinacy, preconceived of obstinacy um, of the Pope. So, but all of this hadn't, for some reason, worried a great part of the Holy Roman Imperial uh, counselors, right, that actually at this point were much more alarmed by the um, Louis XIV's the, the, the aggressive policy in the Flanders, in Germany, and in Italy. Um, and they were also certain that if Charles II of Spain had died without direct heirs, the King of France would have not uh, lost the opportunity to advance his pretense to the Spanish throne in competition with Leopold of Habsburg. And this would have triggered a European explosion like it had never been seen since the time of the Thirty Years' War, which would have actually happened. Um, in fact, you know, in this 30 years of, of new conflicts between 1684 and 1714, even if, you know, with less f uh, ferocious intensity on a, you know, especially at a territorial level, and, you know, with less tragical um, results compared to the period of uh, between 1618 and uh, 1648, but up to actually 1659. But here there was a factor that in 1618 um, had not been present, right? Things can be unponderable, but up to a certain point. 
At the beginning of the Thirty Years' War, the Ottoman Safavid War had prevented the great Sultan of Istanbul to interfere in Europe, right? While at this point, the Turk was, was ready for it, right? And this imponderable should have been, you know, nevertheless, uh, you know, pondered, in fact. And not that, of course, France was much of a, a lesser tra uh, threat in, in this regard, but, you know, what, what happened in 1683 literally changed the history of the world forever and uh, by a short march, right? And these big decisional processes before it had, you know, a dramatic impact on, on the world. So the mornings on the Bosphorus between autumn and spring are usually cold and hazy, right? And the, at the end of the 17th century, they had to be even more so, as in the boreal hemisphere at that time, there was this climatic pessimism in a time that not by chance has been defined as the Little Ice Age, and therefore it had to be, you know, cold and humid, even in the morning of that uh, October the 6th, in the immense encampment that was ready not far from the uh, imperial palace um, at Constantinople. Uh, two days after, after having celebrated the end of the Ramadan, Mehmed the Fort uh, moved, right, in, with this great pump um, that was typical of Ottoman uh, political uh, language. Uh, in uh, from from Constantinople, followed by the Sultanal and Caliphal insignia, uh, the entire court, the military units uh, in charge with the defense of his person, um, the uh, sipai on on uh, horseback and the janissaries on foot, and by his own harem, a mobilization that someone might have deemed as excess even for you know for a long um, hunting season. Right, and a week later, um, the however the greater part of the army moved, right, and proceeding um, before Mehmed, by the way, enforced marches arriving in Edirne, right, and the Sultan al Cortes actually took almost two months to arrive to that. Then consider, you know, the distance is not much. So if you just think about the, the immense. That it was a bit of a, you know. Um, re ritualization in, in this, but we, we don't have to think logistically this was really um, an, a child's game. Uh, arriving to what since the 14th century the Ottomans deemed actually as their European capital, right? Before, you know, the, the conquest of Constantinople, Adrianople had been the, the, the first and most important European possession of the Ottomans. And to the Beylerbey, Bay, the governors that were the head of the uh, imperial provinces, and to the Sankt uh, Bay that depended on them, had been given the order to uh, gather from all over the empire. This stretched from Sudan to Ukraine and from Bosnia to Yemen, so think about what this really was. And also the Timar uh, title holders um, had been uh, precepted. Um, the two uh, gathering centers for the army that would have arrived both by uh, land and sea were Edirne and Belgrade. Right. And in Edirne uh, gathered immediately also the various diplomatical representatives. For example, the ones of the Russian Tsar that was, you know, pushing for having the 1681 truce confirmed, right, and uh, that was uh, ensured as the Ottomans, uh, you know, were enjoying now this long uh, period of security on their northeastern frontier and didn't need uh, disturbances during the Danubian campaign, and also the one of the Transylvanian prince, Mihaly, Apafi, right? It was very punctual in corresponding uh, to the Sultan, the demanded tribute, right? In providing him mil auxiliary military forces, also because he actually feared to be 
put aside by the, uh, the, the rising star uh, mounting among the uh, Christian allies of the Ottomans, Imre Tököri, right, and the Hungarians. You know that, you know, the historically speaking, the Transylvanians have, you know, somewhat uh, preferred, right, you know, to, to remain decentralized from, you know, from the Ottomans rather than from the Hungarians, right? Uh, they preferred uh, a weak Hungary and a strong Constantinople than, than vice versa for, for obvious reasons. Um, if you think about it, and if the Hungarian nobles now had gathered more strength, you know, it would have been a problem also for the Transylvanians. So he showed himself to be very obedient to, to the Ottomans and, you know, giving them also further uh, security on, on, on the northern, yeah, northern frontier. Um, Alberto Caprara was at that point newly called by the Grand Vizier. Right, and he was let know that the clash with uh, the empire might have been avoided, right, and that even the, the truce of uh, 1664 renewed in exchange, however, for the cession of the imperial fortress of Gyur, right, there was just a, you know, 50 miles, let's say, southeast of Pressburg. Bratislava, um, and uh, which is one step from Vienna, of course, and this was evidently another unacceptable request. Not only because uh, giving up that stronghold would have meant to grant the Ottoman army the access to royal Hungary and therefore of the neighboring Austria, but also because, and as the great vizier knew perfectly well, Caprara didn't. Uh, dispose anyway of the necessary authority for such a, an important decision, right? He could uh, only, you know, uh, feed uh, Vienna of, of this request, but uh, before receiving the, the answer, many weeks would have passed while the general mobilization of the Ottoman army was already in act, uh, and the demand could therefore seem senseless, but Unfortunately for the for the Austrians, this was not a, at all, and the Italian diplomat knew it pretty well. What the Grand Vizier needed at that moment was a refuse of the Imperial ambassador, right? Because independently from how you know he would have been presented or motivated, you know it was enough a brilliant pretext to proceed in arms. And we know that on December the 23rd, the Geheime Conference had sent to Constantinople a courier accompanied by an official interpreter in order to present to the Sublime Port a formal proposal for renewing the truce. But uh, on that date, um, both the Sultan and the Grand Vizier were already in trace. Adrenal. And uh, for what concerns the substance of the mm, pretense ad advanced by the Grand Vizier to the ambassador Caprara, uh, his own Venetian colleague Contarini, uh, who was, mm, you know, properly informed of, of, of it, was, uh, was sure that um, it was really about things on, on which, you know, just three people could, you know, could write, could believe in, right? Uh, the deluded ones, such as Hermann of Baden-Baden, those who hoped to escape the future new wave of taxes for the war against the Turk, and those who would have preferred to make war to France rather than to uh, the, uh, the sublime gate. Um, the so-called Spanish party had triumphed in Vienna, right, but the situation was quick to change. And uh, the hostilities had, however, still not formally been declared, nor any border had been violated yet. However, the Ottoman military machine 
was in motion, right? And that's one of those things that you re really you do not want to know that they are happening, especially if you happen to be on the way all the time. Uh, in the uh, Thracian capital, Eterne, was established that the Sultan would have guided the army along the ancient and always efficient uh, Roman military road through the Balkans up to Belgrade, uh, where would have uh, passed eventually um, the command to the Grand Vizier. And in the December of 1682, the Sultan addressed his Holy Roman Imperial peer, let's go in this way, uh, Leopold, uh, with a message that might have been interpreted such as a, you know, a renewed truce offer, right, or at least um, an implicit in ensuring of the fact that his army had been mobilized only in view of a uh, definitive consolidation of the Balkanic positions without, you know, requiring, possibly, because this, is, this seems to be likely, uh, further um, conquests. Right, and consider at this point even you know the costs of the relative expenses of all the army. You know, it, it seems that Constantinople didn't actually mind at that point anymore because the resources mobilized was so huge. We will see now how many troops were were put in motion. That you know the, that was the deterrent in itself, right? And um, you know it was more prudent at that point to just get. Royal Hungary and settling the matter temporarily, at least for a safer uh, negotiation, maybe a weakening with, of the Habsburgic power without recurring to arms, right? And that would have opened to many other uh, options for for the Ottomans. Um, and Mehmet uh, was proposing Leopold actually to recognize to Tokoli the government of Royal Hungary under Ottoman tutelage, right, and was also uh, demanding the dismantling of some Austrian strongholds, right, and uh, the Spanish party at Vienna actually reproached uh, eventually the, the emperor for refusing these demands, right, saying, oh, what, what would you do, you know, just give those fortresses and see what will happen, yeah, well, what would happen is that the gates to also would be opened defenselessly, right? Yeah, and the situation was so serious that actually the same Hungarian Tokoli was freaking out, right? Because guess what? You know the Ottoman army is gonna pass through your own lands, right? To to cross uh, there, and and you know yeah, you really want maybe to gain this uh, kind of uh, petty state uh, between between the Alpsburgs and the Ottomans to be formally recognized, your your kingship or whatever, for your personal gains. But the, the point is that if the Ottomans conquer Vienna, like, chances are that you, you know, you're going to be much more under Ottoman uh, control than you, 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 you wish to be. Um, and, in fact, and the same Tokoli had mm, at, at length hoped uh, on the uh, mediation of uh, John the the Third Sobieski, right, King of Poland, that was just next door, and um, this hope that now had definitely faded, right, because the same Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth at this point was freaking out on his own, right. The Ottomans had already uh, seized Podolia, right. The the the, the you know, Poland realized it would have been next in all this game, um, and therefore they couldn't definitely back now the, the Hungarians for, you know, essentially uh, helping a friend of, of the Turks. Um, and as a consequence, the same Tokoli now tried, you know, to come closer together, guess to whom? To the same Emperor Leopold, to the same Habsburgs, offering, actually, um, his 35 a thousand men, right? Um, which uh, seems bizarre, but, but at that point it was too late, right? What it would have been thirty thousand of his men against the whole Ottoman army, and both um, Thurkoli 
and his, uh, you know, uh, competitor, the Transylvanian prince Mihaly Apafi, together with his prime minister Teleki, were aware that the, o the you know the only option they had left was to play till the end the Ottoman card, right? Because otherwise they would have, they would have not been any. Ch I mean, they would have been literally wiped out. Right. Uh, so just to to make you understand you know, here the 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 degree of you know the fluidity of, of the Danubian frontier, but but what the 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 sheer magnitude of the Ottoman expedition on, on Vienna actually was, just in terms of strictly militarily logistically speaking, and and here we have really have to talk about how the, the forces were put together. I mean, at least part of them because. You know the Ottoman military. Maybe we'll talk about it uh, in detail in another video. But it wasn't just that, as we've seen in other videos, the Ottoman army could rely actually numerically on this uh, hordes, swarms of uh, auxiliary troops from, from every freaking where, right around the empire. All these vassals we we'll see now, and the Sultan, for example, had uh, sent at this point uh, a message. Uh, sealed with the Tugra, which was the uh, sultanial uh, uh, symbol, right, and accompanied by rich gifts, by the way, to the fortress of Bachisarai on the hills of southern Crimea, right, to the uh, barbarous and luxurious residence of Murad II Girai, who was Khan of the Crimean Tartars, Right, was lord of actually a pretty pretty large territory, right? Um, that from the uh, you know the the Black Sea Peninsula of Crimea uh, reached up to the Urals, right? Uh, it was pretty vast, telling you the truth. And uh, the, the Crimean Khanate was uh, a polity the Ottomans had, by you know attacking it, making it a vassal state, had always. Uh, used, uh, you know, uh, somewhat a courtesy and you know, res formal respect to, uh, as um, the the Ottomans were recognizing formally the the greatness of the universal power of the um, of the Mongols or the Mongolian legacy back in the day, right? With which the the Turks of the early hour had shared this, you know, kind of common nomadic culture, right? So uh, at this point they were. <coughs> allies of of the Ottomans and um, and here to uh, Murad obeyed uh, something like 80,000 uh, uh, expert and audacious horsemen right uh, doubtlessly some of, of the best in the world in or at least you know for what the you know the steps standards really were from uh, from Hungary to the um, Bering Strait, um, in uh, of course uh, riding and especially carrying out raids, right? This is what these troops were really about. Talking mostly about light horsemen, and that were capable of remaining on horseback, like for literally for entire days, leaving just subtle stripe of dried raw meat and drink of. Uh, Iran, which is this kind of typical drink from uh, you know of acid milk, likely salted and eventually you know mixed with a bit of water that is spread with various names from Turkey, Russia, Iran, and Central Asia up to the Indukush. Um, this is naturally very energetic, uh, protect foot as you understand. Horsemen that were capable of threatening literally you know Russia up to Moscow. Poland up to Krakow uh, and to deal with uh, this even more, uh, you know, fearsome uh, neighbors, the Cossacks, right? The the Tatars um, uh, left that uh, you know for the word of the steppes that you know certain l legends to, legends to, to spread right around. For example, the tanned um, skins of Cossacks, that, you know, that served them to pack the their own, um, you know, beautiful colored and subtle saddles, uh, for example, um, 
and the Cossacks answered that Tartar skin were the, the bridles of their horses and the scabbarders uh, of their sabers, right? And there were somewhat, you know, words of, uh, you know, bravadery from both sides, but we shouldn't be, you know, swear on it, right? You know, the, those were contacts were really, you know, yeah, people were really, you know, very, very neutral about skinning their enemies alive, right? You know, the Turks and, and, and the Venetians did it, so, you know, the, in the Mediterranean, it's not really a big deal. Look at what, you know, happened between the Austrians and the Hungarians uh, uh, in, in the frontier we're talking about here. Yeah, you know, these things happened, right? It was pretty much more regular than we, we, we think. Um, and to the uh, Crimean Tartar Khan, that was, as we've seen, formally uh, Ottoman subject that lived of uh, in fact of raids fundamentally of uh, slave trade and of the outcome of uh, ransoms of prisoners of war actually um, the Ottoman Sultan didn't transmit you know harsh orders right but as we've seen before they you know he basically dealt with him as if he was a brother like asking help in the name of God right in this kind of steps brotherhood uh, you know, different different political diplomatic languages and also of course the Crimean Khanate was in a dimension on, on its own that should be contextualized but you know anyway the the Ottoman army was powerful definitely but slow right it was burdened by the logistical material by the supplies by artillery right and the instead the Tartar uh, horsemen were speedy light uh, and therefore they were the perfect, the ideal complement of the Ottoman army and even scared the hell even more, right? Because just imagine what it meant like if you were just, I don't know, an Hungarian peasant and seeing all of a sudden uh, this, you know, huge columns of, of smoke for a, an enormous surface starting to rise in the skies darkest peach and in fires in the distance you could see from above it said this this immense endless you know eyesight you know un uncoverable arm moving like a, a a unique body right and think the you know we have talked if you look at the the first um if you look at the first video we made on the prince eugene's series right at where the, the columns of, of refugees that were arriving up to Frankfurt in Germany, right up from, from all of these areas, fleeing for terror, for sheer terror at the Turkish advance. You have to think about the... Uh, this is... That, that video is powerful because it really makes you understand the... you know, the dark, how this whole thing was seen as a titanic clash at that point, right, for really defending the really the heart of Christianity in the sense that Vienna embodied it, even in you know, European politics, you know, the, the center of uh, one of the major Catholic powers, the ones that literally held all the, you know, balance in Central Europe proper, right? Uh, the, the were fundamentally Austria, Italy, and Spain, right? And and the Austrians being, you know, on, on, the, on the more proper frontier at this point, and, and, and risking to be wiped out and subverting the dual order, right? I, I excluded France because you've seen what France was doing here. They were allies with the Ottomans, right? Um, so <laughs> think about all the Protestant, I mean, there was all a, a different uh, culture that segmented Europe this time. And the fall of Vienna would have literally beheaded uh, a, a part of this uh, alliance, right? And it would have been uh, like one of the major changes in the world history of Europe. Surely, I yeah, I think the the most the most important of the of the modern age, at least in sheer political military terms, right? Um, as such, and the strategical, co you know, yeah, the, the, the consequences uh, in general. So imagine these swarms of um, Turkish and Tatar uh, cavalry uh, that literally passed you know across the, the prairies of of eastern and central europe where this uh 
terrifying and uh, undefeatable mix because how do you stop like tens of thousands of horsemen that, that are literally everywhere that infiltrate everywhere it's not that you can hit one place and pretend that, yeah they will go away they will not fight because this is like light uh, horse right they, they're not meant to fight this is not the bulky the, 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 the core of the Ottoman arm but wherever you go uh, they will pass you by right they, they will even surround you will start scorching earth the destroying literally everything they find burning people alive massacring children raping women destroying everything they, they find their side and th this terroristic uh, strategy was exactly what what the ottomans were looking for here because they wanted to make the Habsburgs come to terms now and the harshest they would have been in this regard the more moral upper hand they would have gained because the other side would have freaked out with this is literally what happened right because as we've seen Vienna was was deemed as lost easily heads down um, and um, we don't know actually how many uh, horsemen Murad Girai was able to, to bring with him um, he he was doing it uh, as as we've seen as not as a vassal but as an ally of the Sultan but we have to think definitely that you know wherever it was to raid sending these troops very often by the way were very very free independent right we don't have to think that the Crimean uh, Khanate literally control this look at you know what the Poles dealt with the Cossacks like for example it was all different bands that wherever uh, they knew they could have looted right following on the wake of this massive army they would have simply arrived literally from all over Eastern Europe to to to, to f take their own share so in Vienna there wasn't yet at the time a real uh, information press comparable with the one that for was to be found for example in Paris right uh, there was just a gazette that was printed in Italian and that was inspired by the court and it was chosen to, to you know to be published um, in um, you know at, at the, the, this you know Italian being you know the language of modern Europe at every level of knowledge right so uh, they decided to publish this language in the you know most mm, spread language at the level of the aristocrats of the clergymen and of the people of culture um, to avoid exactly that common people could uh, read it with you know greater ease right and in this sense imagine that the uh, almost 100,000 uh, Viennese that didn't know Italian and that many of them you know would have never neither known actually how to to, to get that gazette were uh, instead more vivacious and sensitive to other news uh, and basically any other type of voice that uh, including the uncontrolled ones which have fake news like crazy right fake news were not invented you know in 21st century just for the record they I mean they literally existed massively in every single historical context you can ever imagine it's a normal business administration um, and uh, the Viennese at the time you know was you know um, were definitely hostile towards France, but also towards Spain, right? Because we have seen that, uh, yeah, here we're talking about the Habsburgs, but, you know, Austria and Spain, yeah, that had a common enemy in the, in, in the French and in the, and in the Ottomans, but uh, they really, they didn't, they were very different. They really didn't like very much each other at the end of the day, and they albeit allied and, you know, ruled by uh, sovereigns of the same family, were fundamentally to separate entities and they didn't trust much of course what what one of the other thought they they also carried out different strategies to, to tell it all um and um and actually they didn't give a damn about the rebellion in hungary like the common Viennese that simply didn't care they thought the hungarians were savages and you know frankly <laughs> for those time standards were very far from the truth um i'm kidding of course but you know that as we've seen before the, they, the two people didn't quite like each other right and also in the following century it was the same thing um, and definitely the the fear for the Turk was one of the principal elements of of warring right they 
they feared that the uh, Hungarian or Tartar raids that probably they they saw as the same people, um, uh, but they they were that there was more than else the collective memory of the siege of 1529, right here. Vienna wasn't besieged just in 1683. You know, the beginning of the 16th century, the, the Turks besieged freaking Vienna. So, um, and they and, and the Viennese had a shared memory of the event, had interrised in a very strong way, right? And when in the autumn of 1663, as we have seen before, the, the voice spread that the infidel was uh, again almost at the gates, right? The, the city had been passed uh, through by, by a terror shiver right um, and something similar of course repeated itself in the autumn 1682 uh, especially as as much as you know think about how information and communication was really at the time you know there were all these various news coming from everywhere right about the movements of the Ottoman forces that um, the, the, the informations which uh, on on which were uh, ever more precise um, in in Vienna uh, had risen after the French conquest of Strasbourg many voices that invoked the war against the Sun King right that had invaded Germany and seized this uh, this heirs of the Empire so uh, now and the hate towards the French were, were, were very strong now the Viennese were, were freaking out so badly that they uh, called for a you know pacification with France and they uh, demanded uh, insurances about the you know measures of security that were to, to be taken against the old and renewed Ottoman de uh, threat right so the winter of 1682-83 was colder than the usual um, in that time that we have seen this phase of uh, general coldening of, of, of the planet and the Sultan's court was surrounded with by his army, was spending time comfortably in Adirne, in, uh, between you know the splendid uh, um, tapestries and uh, precious furs, uh, enjoying the rich game and uh, warming up with these great brass ears in uh, copper and brass scattered uh, within the, the palace. Uh, and this granted to at least many of the Viennese imperial entourage to keep maintaining uh, maybe a you know certain not lightness but uh, you know maybe just for necessity and you know because there wasn't much of an option and kind of an optimistic take on the actual intention of the Turk and anyway the horse insignia that were uh, planted since the beginning of January in front of the of, of the palace of the Thracian metropolis spoke a uh, pretty clear language right from Edirne left and directed to Vienna uh, Rome Venice Paris messages and information were substantially unequivocal right the Sultan was mounting up this most uh, harsh military campaign that was uncomparable with the one of 20 years before that had however been very violent for gross time standards as well this was much much bigger right this was much worse and and everybody had to be prepared very very seriously and the terms of the choice in front of which the Christian world and the princes that guided them were in front of were very clear right leaving or not the emperor and the people of Vienna and of the hereditary lands of the Habsburgs that were close to them alone or not in front of this great peril right uh, Vienna aside from the apprehensions of the populations of course uh, more than more than uh, understandable could um, for example not still be taken into uh, consideration as directly calling to calls, right? As we've seen before, nobody quite r knew what, what the objective was. But if the Ottomans had 
acquired the Danubian strongholds of the Royal Hungary and maintained the alliance with the Hungarians and the Transylvanians, the hereditary possessions of the Habsburgs would have found themselves exposed to a constant threat and you know, the fall of Vienna and of the entire Habsburgic uh, Austrian power would have been uh, you know, one step away from being wiped out. Um, there would be really a lot to talk more about this. You know, this is just this video is just about the Ottoman preparation uh, before the even the proper military expedition. So for now, we we'll stop here. On, on another occasion, we will definitely look at you know what the, the Christians started to do at some point because now all the game of alliances started to be checked and military aids to be started being moved preemptively um, and the same uh, Ottomans will start to move right and there will be some you know important uh, game played strategically before the, the siege proper that will be very important even for the, the development I mean for the timing at least of, of, of the same but we will see this stuff all in another video on another occasion because the, all this stuff is actually pretty pretty heavy and we are like that we are well documented right that that's why I don't make so many modern history videos it's actually because we we know dramatically more right we have at least much more information in general compared to the previous topics um, I mean to previous times in history but um, we will definitely uh, expand gradually you know hopefully at least um, continuing at this so for now we stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye